All right, why don't we get started here, and then we can maybe end a little early and then head off to the uh, Stump 360. So as the title suggests, I want to talk about concurrency today from the ground up. Uh, we'll ask ourselves why. Um, I find that many programmers, myself included, are very sort of top heavy, where we know the, say, the Grand Central Dispatch APIs very well, the sort of leaf nodes, if you will. But a lot of times, I know for myself at least, I don't understand what's going on under the hood. And so I want to understand that a little bit better. Uh, even though I'm a working iOS developer, I can make apps that you know, work reasonably well, don't crash, run relatively quickly. Um, I still didn't study operating systems or any of that stuff, so I think I'm miss, sometimes missing some of the fundamentals. And so that's what I want to cover today. And also, I just like knowing how stuff works. I think it's a common trait among us fellow programmers. And so that's why I want to have a look at concurrency from the ground up, as the slide says. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about concurrency, of course. That's our high-level theme here. But what does concurrency mean? Uh, how does it work? We have those kind of questions as well. So we'll talk about it as well. But I think, um, again, if we ask ourselves why, something that I'll constantly do, why do we want to talk about concurrency? Uh, I think everything that we're learning here this week at the conference is in service of becoming better programmers and writing better code. And so I have two things in particular that I want to, uh, sort of high-level goals that I have. One is to have programs that seem faster to the user, and second is programs that are easy to understand for the programmer. So it's a little bit of sleight of hand here, right? Because programs only need to seem faster to the user. It doesn't mean that they actually have to be faster. Uh, but for point number two, I think this is for real. If you have a program that seems to be easy to understand but actually isn't, that's sort of an anti-pattern. I think not a good thing. So these are the two motivating factors. We want to have, we want users to have a better experience. And again, I'll ask the question, why? Why do we want users to have a better experience? Because we're good people, because we want, we want them to feel good about our apps, we want them to buy more coins and more Smurf berries inside the app and spend more money. I don't know, there's lots of different reasons. You can imagine for yourself what your reason might be. And then we can also ask why. Why do we want programs to be easier to understand? So I think this is the foundation for programmer productivity. We want uh, to reduce our overhead. We want to be more efficient, maybe work faster. But I also think it leads to a higher chance of correct code, code that works, is well written, and doesn't need a lot of debugging time. So all around, we want a better experience for ourselves and for our users. Those are the overall goals, to make programs seem faster and to have them easier to understand for us and for our colleagues. And so the next important question is how? How are we going to do these things? So I have three things that I want to talk about throughout the talk. The first thing is structuring our programs better. So I don't want to do yet another app architecture talk. But programming is all about structure, bringing structure to our ideas. That's what coding is. And concurrency, as we'll see, is about structure as well. Small bits of code with well-defined order and a well-defined set of dependencies. The next thing we'll talk about is thinking in terms of tasks. So our programs are going to be well-structured and we can get down to organizing them on the code level. So how can we manage different threads of execution that are running, maybe at the same time, but also avoid the complexity overhead that that might provide? And how can we give our programs the best opportunity to take advantage of multi-core hardware and to get good performance? And finally, number three is about a mechanism for managing and protecting resources. So we're dealing with systems with limits here. We have limited amount of memory, limited CPU time, networks can be slow, um, all kinds of things like that. So how can we think about dealing with resource management? Specifically, we'll look at locks in the world of concurrency. Locks as the concurrency primitive here. Uh, so that's the plan. We'll talk about these ideas. We'll look at some really simple code samples to demonstrate. And since this is concurrency from the ground up, we'll look at the lower level primitives. So rather than look at Grand Central Dispatch and look at queues and groups and things like that, we'll look at the fundamentals, uh, pthreads and locks. And again, you're thinking, why? Why would you do such a thing? That's no way to live. But part of it, I'll admit, is like the retro appeal, which kind of appeals to me, looking at the sort of old school APIs. But I think the bigger part of it is that understanding what's going on under the hood is important. GCDQs, for example, are like the API is very simple, but they're relatively complicated things going on there to get a queuing mechanism working properly. And so I think understanding how the simpler, smaller pieces work first will help us understand how the bigger pieces work later on. I mean, thanks to GCD, we all know that if you have some troublesome code, it doesn't work quite right, or it doesn't, it's not always consistent, you can just you know, dispatch the main queue and then it starts working all of a sudden, right? Or if you're pro level, you do async after, like 100 milliseconds. And so 
So I want to look at the lower level APIs, again, not because I think you should go home and you should start writing, rewriting everything in pthreads, but because I think that they're simpler conceptually to understand, and they're also the building blocks for things like this. Again, a lot of work going on to asynchronously schedule something for some time in the future. And so these will be the building blocks that we use when we use APIs like this on, on a higher level all the time. Okay, so let's start with the first thing, that's concurrency and structure. So we should first ask the question, what, what even is this thing Concurrency. I think it means one thing in particular, but we use the word a lot when we're discussing things ranging from performance to what queue to do uh, UI work on to threads and multi-core processors, processors and all kinds of things. So why don't we start with contrasting two words that you often hear together, concurrency versus parallelism. So there's a good uh, TLDR quote from a talk by Rob Pike, and he said, concurrency is the composition of independently executing processes. So I like this, because concur concurrency is about composition. It's about composing things together, these small executing processes and building something larger out of them. Maybe we should highlight what concurrency is not. So we're not talking about running stuff at the same time or anything like that, but rather it's a question of organization or of structure. How can we organize these little bits of code to work together into a cohesive whole, we hope? And then next we have parallelism. So parallelism is the simultaneous execution of possibly related computations. That seems simpler to me. This is the simultaneous execution, doing more than one thing at the same time. I like a little bit of hedging here. If it's possibly related, then it's related or not. So we can remove it, make it simpler. Parallelism is the simultaneous execution of computations. Seems pretty simple. So to sum up, concurrency is about dealing with lots of things at once, Parallelism is about doing lots of things at once. So I like this quote because within this context, I consider parallelism to be outside my scope. That's not my job. I'm not the one doing more than one thing. That's the CPU's job or the scheduler's job or the operating system's job or somebody else's. But my job is the, the next thing here, the, that thing up there. My job is making sure programs are structured in a way that lots of things are dealt with properly. That's the core of concurrency. So I'd say that concurrency is a prerequisite for parallelism. I don't know if that's strictly true, but you know, I'm not defending my thesis or anything, so I'll make the claim. That is that we write programs with proper concurrency to ensure that the system can run things in parallel where allowed and where available. So if we move on to Wikipedia, the source of all truth, concurrency involves decomposability, which is having a large operation and then splitting it up into pieces, smaller pieces, that are order, depend, order independent or partially ordered. So maybe you've done this kind of refactoring before, where you take a large function and you split it up into multiple pieces. You have all of these lines of code and they perform a very complicated task and as step one of refactoring, as step one should be, you wanna reproduce the old behavior. So you wanna move the code around and reproduce the old behavior. So we cut and paste things, we split the, the lines up into three functions and then our new running code becomes three calls. Call function A, function B, function C. So this is like the easiest case, it's a cut and paste job. So when we think about decomposability, the easy case is if each of these subfunctions, A, B, and C, are completely independent. Let's say A writes some data to the disk, B sends a message over the network, C displays something on the user interface, they have nothing to do with each other, so that's the easy case. And we know that we could do these things in parallel uh, if we wanted to, but maybe we would never have seen this when it was jumbled together into one block of code. So seeing the structure and doing the refactoring is sort of the first step. And next we can think about, are these things independent or not? But then how do you know it's independent? So we can kind of work through this and think about that. Maybe we can say shared state. Maybe it's the case that the lack of shared state is necessary and sufficient to say that these things are independent. So let's reconfigure it a little bit and we'll say that A is going to generate some data, B is going to use that data, uh, send it over the network, and C is going to get that data and display it on screen. So B and C rely on the data provided from A, so now there's some shared state. So we say, okay, there's a warning here. But B and C are also sharing the state, that piece of data, but my intuition is telling me that B and C are independent because they're using the data, but they're doing different things with it. So we have a couple of clues here to look at, but I think it comes down to shared state, which you started thinking about, and maybe we should start thinking about order. So we know that A has to happen before B happens first, that would be an error because the data hasn't been generated or processed by A yet. And same thing with C. If C happens before A, that's an error. We want A to happen first. So again, thinking back, why is this the case though? But, and maybe as a side note, B and C, I think I've decided, I don't really care if the network call happens first and then we show the UI, or we show the UI and then we do the network, I don't really care what order those things happen in. 
So shared state isn't quite enough. Maybe the missing link is mutation. Everybody's worst enemy, shared mutable state. So A is creating the data, there's a mutation event, and so that implicitly suggests to us that order is now important. For example, if B mutated the data, then it becomes important to think about does B happen before C or not? But we're assuming that B doesn't change the data, C doesn't change the data, and so they are independent tasks. So if order doesn't matter, then we can say two things are independent. If shared state is in play, that might be a hint that something has to happen before something else. And if mutable data is in play, then I think there's a strong sense that order does matter and you have to think about it. And then if order matters, then things get more difficult. We have to do callbacks or notifications or some other mechanism to ensure correct order. And then we start questioning our choice of careers working in iOS, I think, isn't it? Don't we? All right, so we've broken down our program into these smaller pieces. We're thinking about tasks, now we're thinking about ordering, and now we're wondering what kind of mechanisms do we have to deal with this. So that whole part about structuring your program into smaller functions, that's sort of out of the scope of this talk because you know, I have no idea what your applications are doing. And I don't know if you've checked, but there are a lot of apps out there in the store. So I have no idea what your apps are gonna do. That's sort of for you to decide. But the whole part about um, what is in scope is what we just looked at. Once I've modeled my program into these smaller pieces, then how do I model the dependencies and the, or the independence or the order requirements and to get the sort of parallelizability, that's a hard word to say, uh, between them. Uh, that's our signal that it's time to look at some code. So let's switch it out, see if technology is good to us today. Uh, yes, let me switch to our starter project here. Okay, so I've already done the very hard work of splitting up my large application so I have these helper functions available, process data, log to network, write to disk, show busy status, which we'll look at later. Um, so let's try running one, and we're gonna use the pthread API. So I've broken this up into functions already. What we need to do is create a thread, link it to a function, and then let the thread run free, like a puppy. Okay, so we'll uh, create a variable here for a thread, like so. I'll just scroll this up, you don't need to see the names anymore. And then we need to call uh, pthread create, you need to pass in, let me copy and paste this, so it's a little easier for me. So uh, you have to pass this in as an, it's a C, it's a C based API. So you have to declare the variable, you pass it in as an in out parameter and it will write it when it's done. Uh, thread attributes, sorry, thread attributes is nil. We wanna call our process data function that I've already handily written and we don't care about the arguments, so those will be nil. So I'm creating a thread, linking it to a function, letting the thread go, let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. So I'll run this. It is compiling. It's a 12 inch MacBook, you have to make allowances. It's running, and run succeeded. I see nothing, it did nothing, it seems. Um, I, I didn't, as a side note, I didn't want to do UI because I'm like a command line person, so the program will actually talk, so you'll hear it over the speakers when it's doing something. Okay, but we didn't see anything, I didn't hear anything, so what's the problem? We've created this thread, but at this point, the program has terminated, so you create this thread, and then you're like, oh, program's over, and then all of your threads get killed. So we need to wait for this thread to complete. So in the pthread world, you have to do a pthread join. The terminology is a little bit weird, I think. But you need to join the thread. So this line here, this will block until that work is done. And then at this point here, uh, the processing is complete. I'll just put a comment there so we know. That's what's gonna happen at this point. So we'll spin up the thread, and then we will wait for it to complete. Let's give it a run and open our ears and see if we see anything. It's running. Process to be complete. Okay, so talk to us, and so that's my user interface. So there we go. Okay, so that's pretty good. We're good there. Let me, uh, as I always say, my favorite, copy-paste development, or CPD. I'm gonna copy this just to show you the um, show busy status function, which is a little bit of UI that I have written. So I'm gonna create another thread for my uh, busy status thing here. We will do the same thing. I'm gonna call pthread create. We're gonna create the thread. I'm gonna call link it to this function. And uh, I guess we should also wait for it to finish. So I'll run this. The process data will happen first, and then this thing will run. Uh, oops. Process data complete. And I get this. So if you've ever done any terminal programming or you were a DOS programmer, programmer back in the day, maybe you made one of these ASCII-based spinners before. If not, it's a lot of fun. You should try it. 
so this is the show busy status function right here. And this thing is just going to spin forever and ever and ever until you stop it. But because I have pthread join here, it's going to wait for it to complete, which it will never do, and it will just go on and on. So I need to stop it manually. So the overall plan is I want to process the data, do all my stuff with it, and then finish, while I hope in parallel show the busy spinner so that everybody knows that something is happening. So I'm going to do these, this work in parallel, I hope. OK, let's look at the other requirements, though. Uh, oh, that's the wrong app. Come back here. OK, so we process the data. Once I process the data, I need to log it to the network, and then I need to write it to disk. So after, so I'll come back to the busy spinner uh, later. But uh, let me just paste just these two here. So after the data is complete, I'm going to log it to the network. So I'll make another thread for that. Like so, we will uh, create the thread, and I already have my helper function called log to network, like that. And I'll do the same thing for writing it to disk. Okay, so same thing. I create my thread variable. I think it's write to disk is what I called it. And then I need to call pthread create, create the thread, and call the write to disk function. And then we can think about dependencies a little bit. So I've already been waiting for the process data to complete. So at this point, it's completed. And I'm doing these two other things. And then we have to think about, do I need to wait for these as well? And we'll run into the same problem again. The program will end. And maybe the writing to disk and the network won't be able to finish. So I think I have decided, yes, I do need to join these threads as well. So I will join the uh, log to network. I think I need to force and wrap. Again, apologies. It's C API. We have to make allowances. Um, and then I'll also join the uh, write to disk, like so. And then that will all run. So the order looks good, the dependencies look good, but I want to do this thing at the same time, so I have to make those threads go at the same time. It looks, a lot, it looks very complicated. So what I'm going to do is I will uh, cut, I think, all of this. This is all of my work of processing the data and doing stuff with it. So I'm going to cut that. And I have very handily made this do work function. Paste it in here. So the do work will do all the work that we just wrote. You'll have to, again, p threads, see it needs these unsafe mutable raw pointers, just kind of ignore them. Avert your eyes. And instead, what I'll do is I'll create a thread for doing the work, like this. Another thread. We'll do another p thread create. So you'll notice that inside the thread, I'm going to create more threads, which is totally allowed. Uh, we're going to do the work. Uh, no thread attributes. We're going to call the do work function. We don't care about the arguments. So now I'm going to spin off a thread to do the work. I'm going to spin off another thread, we hope, in parallel to show the spinner. I need to wait for the work to complete. I don't want to wait for the spinner because the spinner will never complete. So I need to wait for the thread, or sorry, wait for the work. And then at this point, we're all done. And the program will terminate. But maybe this isn't the end of the program. We should be good citizens. And uh, let me pthread cancel the. Uh, show busy status with a force unwrap. I think that's correct. I'll just build and install a little bit. Um, all right, so that's what it's going to do. It's going to talk to us. Hopefully, we will see the spinner. We'll see the process data, log to network, and write to disk will all happen. Uh, who knows when they'll finish. Let's give it a run, and we'll give it a try. OK, it's compiling. It's spinning. Process data complete. We're still waiting. Write to disk, log to network complete. And we've exited. OK, so it worked. And if you notice, I'll run it one more time. But the, uh, log to the, the fake log to network and the write to disk, the, the speech kind of overlaps a little bit because they're actually going on different threads. Let's do it one more time. Process data complete. Write to disk log to network complete. OK, and then we ended. That was when I was supposed to take a sip of water. But I don't have any water with me, so. <laughs> All right, so you heard those two things. So they are running in parallel, and they finish with some undetermined order, but we don't really care what the order is. Um, and so that's how we manage our threads, waiting for threads, managing order, and managing uh, dependencies. Is this going to come back? All right, let's go to the slides. I think they might be frozen. All right, just bear with me for a minute. I need to restart the slides. OK, so we started by thinking about structure, structure in your program and then breaking down code into functions, which happens to match with the pthread model, where one thread has to be one function. And then 
So a thread drops a function, and then you link it to the execution of that, and then you spin off new threads, and then you wait for them to complete before you spin off even more threads, and so on and so on. And you have all of these units of work, or functions in our case. So we did all that using pthreads and functions, but you can imagine how you might do this with the concurrency API of your choice. If we had TCP queues, you can imagine having a serial queue and pushing work onto it in a particular order so that they will start in a particular order. Maybe you can imagine using groups and saying, I have these two work items, and I have this other work item, and I'm going to wait for that one to finish before I start the second one. Or if you've done an operation, I think this is probably the, the most straightforward. You have an operation A, an operation B, and you set A as a dependency for B, and then they'll all run in the correct order. If A finishes, uh, finishes with a good status, it'll continue with B. So you can imagine how to do this with the higher level APIs, but fundamentally, I think the pthread API shows what it is at its core. Starting a task, running some code, and waiting for it to finish. That's it. I think these other APIs are great. These are the ones that I use day to day, but fundamentally, the problem that we're solving is one of like ordering and one of waiting, which I think the pthread API demonstrates. Okay, so if we're using threads to model our tasks, and we have tools like joining a thread, waiting for it to complete, and we can cancel threads, so we have all this management stuff, thread attributes, which we didn't even look at, and so on, then how do we model our concurrency needs around data and resources? So locks are a super simple general purpose thing for protecting resources. And by resources, I mean pretty much anything, an array, a piece of memory, property, calling into a function, uh, writing to disk, whatever it is. And then when I say protecting a resource, by protecting, I mean limiting access to it. So if you have some helper function that's a pure function, right? It takes inputs, uh, there's no shared state, uh, there's no side effects, and then you can call it from multiple threads because it has everything it needs to do and nothing will conflict, but then that's fine. But if the function deals with shared state or it keeps an internal counter or something like that, then you need to make sure it's called just once at a time if you have a multi-threaded application. So a simple binary lock, which is just on or off, is something that will let you do this. Okay, the puppy is back. So let's have a quick look at um, locks. Still running, let me switch to the second piece of code here. So I've written a class here to model a room, the room class. It has an internal counter, and this is gonna count uh, attendance, like how many people here are at the top. So I've got two functions here, one for enter. When you enter a room, it'll increment the counter, and when you leave a room, it'll decrement the counter. I've instantiated a room for Aspen Ballroom, which we're all in, to represent where we all are, and then I have resources or people. If you're a manager, maybe you like calling people resources, so I'm gonna do that. So I've got, uh, at the main door, I have a dispatch queue here for Agnes, who's gonna stand at the main door, and we're just gonna simulate this, and Agnes will count 6,000 people coming into the room. So we have our resource set up here as a queue, and then I have the side door, and we have Tammy there, and we're gonna simulate Tammy's gonna count 4,000 people coming into the room, and then we have a third resource, and we have Sam, who's standing at the emergency exit, and we're gonna simulate 1,000 people leaving the room. And so this will be our simulation, and if my math is correct, uh, Tammy can correct me, we have 6,000 coming in, 4,000 coming in, which is 10,000, 1,000 leaving, so we should have 9,000. When we're all done, and at the bottom, we will print out the count. You should get a sense of doom at this point. Let's run this and see what happens. So I'm gonna run this, and it's compiling. And, the count is 8,574, which is not 9,000. Let me run it again, because, you know, second time's a turn. 5,169, okay. Sometimes I'll get zero. Am I gonna get zero? Sometimes it, no. Sometimes the fourth time I get zero. 6,000, one more time. Okay, see, dreams come true. So I get zero, so this should be, this should be a little bit of a hint. This is what we ran into in the first example, right? We spun off some threads and then we ran the program, but the program ended before the threads could do any work. So this suggests to me, by giving me zero, that what's happened is we have set all these things to run asynchronously, and then we print out the count, but nobody, none of our resources have been doing their jobs because you know, they're not very good resources, I guess. You know, performance review upcoming. And before they've had a chance to increment or decrement the count, we've printed it out and it's zero, so that's no good. We can verify this though. Let's. Um, I'm a print statement debugger. How many people are print statement debuggers here? Yeah, okay. Everybody else uses breakpoints? Yeah, we don't want to hear from that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We welcome everybody. So I'll say Sam is done. I'll just print out the log statement here. Uh, this is after the for loop, but still inside the asynchronous, so still inside the queue. I'll print one out here for uh, Tammy. 
is done, and we'll do one more before uh, Agnes is done. Okay, so I'll run this. And then you can see it prints out the count first before everybody finished. So somebody got something done, but we still print out the count too early. Um, let me just run it again so we can see some variation here. Uh, the order is correct in this time, bad example. Maybe I'll get one in the middle? No, nope. one more. Fourth time's a charm. Yes, Sam, Tammy finished, then we print out the count, and then Agnes got her work done. So the order is not correct here. So what are we going to do? We, we're using a GCD here, so you could imagine, I don't know, serial queue. If this were P threads, we would do a join and wait for it to finish. But instead, let's try out locks, because why not? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a lock, and then we'll talk about what locks are. So I'll make an Agnes lock. We'll use a NS lock, because it's a nice API. It's uh, object oriented. There's not that much to locks, though, anyway, so we should be OK. Uh, let me just copy paste this. OK. So, and let me do this as well, and then we can talk about it all together. OK, so I'm going to create a lock, which is like a, uh, I was thinking of examples. I was thinking token ring network, which is like a horrible example, because nobody uses them anymore. But a token ring network, kind of like passing the shell around so that one person can talk at a time. So you have a token, you pick up the token, you're allowed to broadcast on the network, and then you put the token back. And then somebody else picks up the token, is allowed to talk. If I want to talk as well, I'll be like, oh no, there's no token. So I don't do it so we don't collide over the network traffic. And I'm sitting there waiting, and as soon as they drop the token, I pick it up and I can start broadcasting. So that's the idea behind the lock. If you call the lock, then you can say you are going to acquire the lock, and then I'll do all of my work, and when I'm done my work, I can then unlock and release the lock. So this call right here, is blocking. This line will wait until the lock is available. Sometimes there's API to do a peek to, you know, hey, is the lock available? Yes or no, and it'll tell you. But this call will block, which is, uh, I think, what we want. So let's do that a couple more times. So I'm going to create a uh, Tammy lock here, like this, and then we'll call Tammy lock dot lock before she does the work, and then after she's finished, we'll call uh, unlock. And then just one more. So we've got Sam as well. And I will create a lock for Sam. Before Sam starts his work, I will make sure he acquires the lock. And then after he finishes his work, I will then release the lock like this. OK, so that will make sure that there are these locks in existence and we'll be able to tell whether they're doing any work or not. And that means that before I print out the count, I need to make sure that everybody is done. So I'm going to do that by acquiring the lock. So I'm going to say, because Sam is holding the token and he's doing his work, and I'm already at this line waiting to print out the count. But I'm like, oh, I need to get that lock first. And as soon as Sam is done, I can pick it up and then print out the count. But I need to do that for all three of my resources. Oops. Uh, Agnes is spelled like that. And then Tammy is spelled like this. And then we can print out our lock. And then our program ends at this point. So we're good. But to be good citizens, we should, of course, release the lock when we're done. Not strictly required, because this is the end of the program, but let's do it anyway. OK, so I'll run this. And the order looks correct. Agnes is done, Tammy is done, Sam is done, and then the count. So we'll note that I don't really care who finishes first. Agnes finished first, that's great, but I don't care. All I care about is the count is at the end. So let me run this a few more times, because we did get that. All right, Sam is first this time, Agnes is last and we print out the count. So the order is correct. People are doing their counts, they're finishing their counts, and then we're printing it out, but the count is still incorrect. So what else are we missing? So if I scroll all the way to the top, we can see that we are mutating our property. We have our count property here, and we're mutating it from three different threads, and it's three different queues, I should say, in this case, which are like threads. But anyway, we have, we have this problem of mutation from multiple places, so we have a data race going on that we need to fix. So how can we fix it? Again, several ways. We could use a mutex. We could put it on a queue. But let's go with, again, our friend, the lock. So we'll make a lock here, uh, private. Uh, let's do something different. Let's do an OS unfair lock, because it has a slightly more challenging uh, API. Not really. They're all pretty similar. OK, so when we enter it, before I do the mutation, I need to make sure I'm holding the lock. And when I finish the mutation, I need to release the lock. So it's pretty simple. You can do OS. No, I wanted to copy this. OK, so I've created the lock as a property. I can call OS unfair lock lock with the, prop with the lock, passed in as a reference, of course, because it's a C API. 
And when I'm done, I can call unlock and pass in the lock. And I can do the same thing, let me do it like this. For leave, before I mutate it, I'm gonna acquire the lock, and when I'm done, I can call unlock. All right, so do two different kinds of locks. This one is going to be protecting our property. Let's run this one. And order is still correct. The count is 9,000, could be a fluke. We gotta run it at least four times. I'm just kidding, let's run it one more time. Um, all right, so everybody finished. The count is correct, 9,000, 10,000 entries, 1,000 people left, and the count is correct. All right, success. Let's go here. Sorry, I gotta reset the video again or it won't advance. Yes. Okay, uh, so we looked at locks, but we saw two different uses of locks. We saw one with locks as a signal. So this was the making sure people are, making sure this task is finished before I start this other task. So in the previous code example, we saw it using pthreads. We did a pthread, we did a join, and then we did more work after it was finished. And in this case, we used a lock to do something very similar, where I acquire the lock, I do some asynchronous work, and then I release the lock, and then out there in the universe, somebody is like, waiting for the lock. Kind of like, um, you know, if you use the delegate pattern, for example, I'm calling somebody directly. If I use notifications, I'm just broadcasting a notification, and it's like, ah, oh, somewhere in the world, somebody might be listening to this. A lock is very similar. It's like, I'm gonna pick up the lock, I'm gonna do my work, when I'm done, I'm gonna release the lock, and like, maybe somebody out there will look for it, but I don't know. Um, so, you can see how locks can function as a kind of a signal. And then the second thing we saw was locks, maybe the more uh, usual use, is locks as mutual exclusion, or as a mutex. So you're trying to have, you know, you're trying to exclude other people from doing something at the same time, and so you have, I have, I wrap my property access inside a lock to get this uh, mutex kind of behavior. And we looked at two examples, NS lock and OS unfair lock, pretty similar API. Locks are very simple things. They pretty much have lock and unlock, and sometimes a look at the state of the lock, but it's pretty much a binary on-off kind of a thing. Uh, there's also, also the pthreads also has a mutex, which is the same kind of thing. We could look at that as well, but you know, they're all pretty similar conceptually. Um, but then there are more complicated things as well. So you could imagine I have three resources at each door, um, and they each had their own lock, but you could say, well, why can't I have like, if only there was something like a counting lock, where I could say Agnes checks in, Sam checks in, Tammy checks in, and then I would say, I'm not gonna print out the count until I'm down to zero. It's like, kind of like a reference count iOS programming when we had to do manual memory management. So then, it's Tammy was complete, Sam was complete, Agnes was complete, it goes down to zero, and then I could um, move on. Sort of what a semaphore is, you can think of it as like a counted lock, but again, if you don't understand what a lock is, you can understand what a lock with a counter might be, which is sort of what a semaphore is. Dispatch groups, similar kind of thing, they have the enter and leave method, where you can like, you have to balance your enters with your leaves before the group can continue. Similar kind of thing, again, you can imagine how you might implement that with uh, with locks. All right, so if we go backwards here, we talked about protecting resources. So that was using locks as the fundamental concurrency uh, thing operation. Again, very simple, lock, unlock, wait for lock. And the basic idea there was that ensuring that two things won't step on each other and that we can maintain some kind of uh, consistency there. So we have all these resources and people that we want to, properties, memory addresses that we want to protect, but how do we protect our code. There's one resource in particular that we, I think in particular, are very interested in, which is our code. So if we, we have a separate sort of thing for this, where we can think about tasks in terms of functions, in terms of threads, and that's how we can model it in the world of concurrency, thinking about tasks, threads, and that will help us worry about order. And then on the macro level, specific to you, is how do you structure your programs better, correctly, so that it makes sense. And if we pop the stack all the way back to the beginning, we had our two sort of things that we wanted. Programs that seem faster to use. So user-facing performance, thanks to parallel, parallelization, which is hard to say. Um, there are, of course, lots of different ways to get high-performance apps. This is just one thing that you have in the toolbox. There are lots of other things. But this is a really important one, I think, thinking about concurrency to get better performance. And then finally, the idea of splitting code into smaller pieces, which will help uh, yourself understand it, help your colleagues understand it, and also to make the dependencies and the order understandable so you know what it's doing to avoid bugs and the like. So there are a lot of APIs out there available to do concurrency related things. We looked at a few of these. I put the C APIs in the uh, dangerous orange and then the nice object oriented ones in the very pleasing blue. Um, so there's a lot of th stuff to look at out there. Um, so I'll return to the question of why. Why, why, did, why, why did I want to look at pthreads? and locks for 30 minutes. 
Um, so I hope that looking at concurrency parameters will give you some idea on better structuring your programs. Again, I think looking at the most basic piece, breaks, loss, can help you think about it in a more simple way, which just makes it easy to understand. I mean, even when I look at code that I wrote last month, I, you know, I have trouble sometimes. Um, also, I hope that looking at the concurrency primitives has sort of tweaked your curiosity a bit. If you've never looked at uh, dispatch groups before, or you don't know what the semaphore is, or you have never used p-thread mutexes, but you've used unfair locks, and you're curious about what the difference is, I hope it's sort of piqued your curiosity a little bit about these things, and maybe also about how these things work or how they might be built, which is interesting to me. For example, I think if you understand a lock, and I said, could you build a queue with a lock, you can think, well, let's see, I could like spin off a thread, uh, I could run some code, I could get a lock, run some code, and then unlock it, and somewhere else, I could wait for the lock, run some code, and unlock it, and if I chain those together into a queue, maybe I can have something with a queue. Um, same thing with the semaphore, building a semaphore with locks. So again, I think understanding these sort of foundational pieces helps with understanding of the, uh, the higher level stuff. So I do hope that knowing how these concurrency primitives work will also make you more thoughtful about using the higher level APIs that we probably use every day. And that is all I got, so thank you very much.